Well, it was two weeks ago that I had the privilege of introducing you to the newest member of our pastoral staff, Ted and Sarah Harris and their family. I've known Ted for going on 25 to 30 years. We've been friends in the ministry together. We've spent some time at different pastors' gatherings together. Ted goes back even farther to the founding pastor of this church, Carrie Bowman, and he were good friends in the ministry in days when Eagle was just a, a dream in Carrie and Melissa Bowman's heart, you know, and he was talking to Ted and Sarah Harris at times like that, and so just long history that they have, and through all the years that I've uh, walked alongside Ted or been around Ted and Sarah as a family, just a few things stand out to me that I've respected, appreciated, and admired so much. First of all, Ted has a humility that just, just kind of oozes out from him in every sphere. So his humility, his kindness, like he was one of those guys in district conference that would just always in a kind way find you and ask you about your life and what's going on with you and uh, the, the load you're carrying and would always find time for a lunch or a breakfast in those settings. That was a Ted Harris. This was so kind. An obvious love for Christ, but maybe the one that stands above them all is I've admired a long obedience in Ted Harris's life that moves into the third decade now of ministry. Here's a man who simply stayed faithful to God's call on his life to vocationally serve Jesus' church in a lot of different ways, in a lot of different settings, and he's just kept his hands to the plow in every season, which ministry has its seasons, right? And so I've just admired long obedience, one direction. And so let's put our hands together. Welcome back to the stage. Pastor Ted Harris. Wow. You said that just the way I asked you to. <laughs> the, uh, it, it is good to be here. We are looking forward to uh, ministry in your midst, uh, in our midst now. Uh, and uh, just long and fruitful is what we have been praying for. Uh, yes, our, we go back many, many years. But let me just tell you, the first sermon to any new church, when a pastor comes in, the first sermon to any new church is always a little weird. It's just an interesting one. You don't know me, and I don't know you. And so connecting and personally, you know, you always think, are they going to think that's funny? Are they, you know, do they get sense of humor? Do they get personality? Do you, and, and some of you have read my resume and I look really good on paper. And, and many have heard the interview last week or seen it online and you've got the facts of my family and, and schooling and past ministry experience, history, but knowing where you grew up, knowing where you work, who your spouse is, who your kids are, doesn't really mean we know each other. To know your heart, what makes you tick. My, my fav, one of my favorite phrases is what makes you pound the table. What gets you excited in a meeting that you just want to pound the table? That takes time. That takes intentionality, and we are at the beginning of that, and I look forward to those times of sitting around with, with many of you, or all of you, I would hope at some point, to just hear what makes you tick, what makes you pound the table, get you excited, get your blood pumping. This morning, I want to share some of what God has done in my life, where my heart is, and as I say, what makes me pound the table. These verses that I'm going to share, John 10.10, 10, Romans 12, 1 and 2, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, are three verses that really have been foundational over the years in developing my heart for ministry, my, my heart to follow and chase after Jesus, and kind of brought me to where we are today, almost 34 years. I think it's 33 years and 11 months. Somewhere in March, we'll hit that 34-year Part. And so my prayer this morning is that you hear my heart and that you see the thread that weaves these three verses together 
and that hopefully you will find hope, encouragement, or maybe somewhere along the way be challenged. My challenge this morning is that I am used to preaching 45 minutes to an hour. So hold on, this may be a bumpy ride. (laughs) Father, this morning, thank you for your word. Thank you for the word that we have, the scripture that we have that not just contains truth, but is truth. And thank you most of all for the word, your son, Jesus. Holy Spirit, would you come and open our hearts and our minds to this truth, to this word, to Jesus this morning. We pray in his name. Amen. So turn with me to John chapter 10. We're going to start right off here. John chapter 10, and I want to begin reading with verse 7. Jesus is giving teaching to the Pharisees, to the crowd, the disciples that are there, and he's really identifying uh, himself to them, letting them know who he is, and using a number of analogies, and his, one of his favorites is shepherd, because everyone there understood what a shepherd was. And he says to them, so Jesus said to them again, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did, sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life abundantly. A couple of words that Jesus uses that we need to understand here is the first one, life. What does he mean by life? That I have come that you might have life. That word life is not just that you might have a life, that you might have a job, a family, a place to live, that you might have friends around it, but that goes much deeper than that. It is a life that is full. It is a life of vitality. It's not just alive, but it is truly living. I have come that you might truly live, not just have a day-to-day existence that might be good. The word implies that the only true life is the life that Jesus gives, the life that is devoted to God, the life that is chasing after him. This life has its roots in the divine, has its roots in in God's character. It's It's a life as God designed it. Do you realize that God designed a life for you? Not just life, not just happenstance, not just accidental. God has designed refers to eternal life that Jesus comes to give. A life that goes far beyond this body, these days, these ages. And then he adds a clarifier. He says, I don't just come to bring you life as if this vibrant life with God isn't enough. He says, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Some translations will say, and have it to the full. I don't think full is the best clarifier. Because we can have stuff full. I can have a a glass that is full. But this word abundantly means overflowing. Beyond full, exceedingly. I have come that you might have a life that is exceeding in God's goodness. Over and above what you'd expect. More than is necessary. Combined, Jesus is bringing us a life that is beyond our wildest expectations of vitality. I said three verses, three lessons. Here's lesson number one. Jesus always has more. Jesus always has more. Our cup is never full. It's always the ability to be overflowing. Someone said, dear, are you a person who sees a cup half full or half empty? Are you an optimist or a pessimist? And I said, I see a cup that is half full that has the potential to be overflowed when given to God. I was challenged recently with Paul's words to the Corinthians And just listen to these. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Jesus always has more. Jesus, there is a spirit, there is a power that it resides within him that goes far beyond anything I could say, Eric could say, Julie could say, Kim could say, anyone who stands on this carpet that comes up with some very slick, persuasive way. Mm -mm. Paul says what, what we have in Christ goes way beyond any human idea. Not persuasive words, not some slick presentation of biblical truth, not, but a demonstration of the Spirit, a demonstration of power. Jesus always has more, and that more life is one powered by the Holy Spirit, where things happen that the only explanation is God. I want that life. I want a life where things happen that the only explanation is God. I think my being here this morning, the only explanation is God. I was not planning. We were in Muncie at Muncie Alliance Church for seven and a half years. Was not planning to leave. We were making plans for 2022 with the elders. We were going through kind of a reboot. We were wanting to treat the church as if it was a church plant and never done anything before. We were dreaming. We were, and Eric starts a conversation. Hey, you ready to leave Muncie? No. And we laughed. And through God, through, through his opening doors, his closing doors, his moving, his action, the desire to discern, the desire to chase after him, here we are. God has more. More life-powered by the Holy Spirit. Now, we have to understand that, that you're achieving more, you're being more, you're experiencing more, you're growing more, you're maturing more, isn't about you and your effort. More is not in you. You don't have more in you. Jesus is the more. Jesus is the more. That didn't always describe my life, and truthfully, some days it still doesn't. I wasn't taught about the Holy Spirit growing up. When I accepted Christ as a 12-year-old, I just was ushered into salvation. I now have eternal life. And the church that I was, was at at the time and kind of grew up in through my teenage years, that was the most important thing. Just get you saved, get you baptized, you're in. And then try your best. The rest of the time. Read your Bible. Try to do what it says. There, there was no discipleship. There was no coming alongside and, and, and growing and, and being encouraged or even being taught that the Holy Spirit now has a, a change. Coming into the Alliance 34 years ago, God began to show me more. More of who he is, more of, who, uh, of what he can do, more of what he desires to do in our life. That it's not just salvation, as if that's not enough, but he has more life exceedingly, abundantly beyond. I'm guessing at times you've looked at your own life and said, is this it? Is this really all there is? There's got to be more to it than this. It's easy to fall into that rut of same old, same old every day. Spiritually, same old, same old every day. And we reach a point of not really expecting God to show up. I'm going to pray for this to happen, but I don't know. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Maybe this person will be healed. Maybe they won't. Prayers probably won't be answered. Have you ever caught yourself in that rut? Jesus has more. The good news is there is more. More grace, more mercy, more wisdom, more power, more compassion, more strength, more joy than you could ever imagine 
in the person of Jesus. Do you long for more? Do you get up every morning longing for more, praying for more, asking for more? More of the unexplainable. I'm currently reading a book by J.P. Moreland, who's a, a, a Christian philosopher, professor at Biola University, and he wrote a book called A Simple Guide to Experience Miracles. And the whole thing just opens up to, to the more. It's asking this question. There is more that God has than what we've experienced. And I don't care what you've experienced. I don't care how high you have been spiritually, how, 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 where you live, if you live way up and, and, and your relationship with God is incredible and you've seen answered prayer, God still has more. It's simply feeding my need. This book is simply feeding my need and my desire for more. I want more of Jesus. I want more of the Holy Spirit. I want to see more of that demonstration of power amongst us. More doesn't mean no more trouble, okay? More doesn't mean no suffering. More doesn't mean more comfort. Francis Chan said, if you are comfortable, you don't need the comforter. I don't ever want to be comfortable. I want to be in need of more. Every step in my journey, every church, every ministry, every station of life has revealed areas in my life that need more. And I'm still in that process of learning that Jesus provides what I lack. And how great my dependence is on him. So this morning, there's more. There's more that Jesus wants to give, that Jesus offers you. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, again, may be very familiar to you. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Lesson number two, more leads to transformation. If you want more, if you're going to chase after more, you've got to be ready to be transformed, to be changed. Because if you're going to get more of the life of Jesus that Jesus has, something has to go from your old life. Something has to depart. Something has to be changed to make room for. If I'm going to buy more clothes, some old clothes are going to have to go out, right? If I'm going to buy more books, then some books are going to have to go out. That's never going to happen. I'm just going to let you know that right now. I will not throw books away. I'll just buy another bookcase, okay? They don't even have to be good books. I have a hard time throwing away bad books. Two words again that we need to understand in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. The first one is conform. Paul says, do not be conformed. This is a worldview verse. Your worldview is the thought process by which you make decisions. But we can no longer, and this says that we can no longer think or act like the world. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Our soul can no longer be shaped by the world. And let me just tell you, from the moment you are born, that first breath, your soul, your life was being shaped by something. The question is, by what? What is shaping you? What is is forming you? Your thoughts, your actions, your, your beliefs. If it is not shaped by Jesus in truth, then it is being shaped by the world. It's a worldly worldview. A world has an operating system, if you will, that does not reflect God's character. And we're seeing more and more of that in the culture around us. That as God is being removed from parts of life, we're seeing that this this human worldview is coming into play. And if we're not careful, we can be shaped by that. 
that over the last hundred years, the operating system of the world has been powered by an atheistic thought process, making man the center of the universe. I've got some good news for you and some bad news for you. Here's, and it's all the same phrase, okay? This is good news and bad news. You are not the center of the universe. Now, some of you may say, yep, that's, that's bad news. You consider your, yourself that, you know, that the world revolves around your belly button. It doesn't. But that's also good news because otherwise you would be in control of everything, and you're not. Jesus is. Jesus has more. And if we're going to experience the more, we've got to be transformed. We've got to be changed. We can no longer be conformed by the image of this world, by the pattern of this world. But that second word, be transformed, is, is metamorphosis. We understand that word. It's the, it's the caterpillar in the cocoon to the butterfly. The idea of the outward appearance being changed to reflect the inner. What is really going on on the inside? And Jesus offers a different life. A new life. Jesus is offering us his life. A life that only Jesus can give and a life that is, is more than. If I want more of Jesus, it's going to require a lot less of me. Things in my life are going to have to change. There are habits, there are sins, there are thought processes that are less than what Jesus has in mind. And many times I've allowed those to shape me to shape my thinking sometimes it's hard in the transformation the hardest part for the caterpillar and the butterfly is the cocoon that complete transformation that what comes out looks nothing like what went in Transformation is what theologians call sanctification, and it's a process of being made holy, of being conformed to the image of his son, Romans says in chapter, or Paul said in Romans chapter 8. Set apart, prepared for more. God wants to prepare you for more. A reshaping of our soul, of our heart, of our mind. We talk about asking Jesus into our heart, and that's good, but Paul is saying here that we cannot forget that God wants to shape the mind. He wants to shape our intellects. I've given a good portion, my wife and I have given a good portion of the last 34 years focusing in on changing the intellect, changing the way we think, what we think about, how we think. R.C. Sproul, let me give you this quote, it was in your, it's in your notes, it's rather long, says, we, we're probably living in the most anti-intellectual period in the history of the church. Not anti-scientific, not anti-academic, but anti-intellect, anti-mind. The Bible tells us that we are called as Christian people not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed. And the way of that transformation is through the renewing of the mind. We've been made by our Creator to have a direct line from the brain or the mind to the heart. And so for the scripture, the new mind brings with it always a new heart. But you can't bypass the mind in an attempt to have a renewed heart. And that is what people are trying to do today. I don't want to learn. I don't want to study the word of God. I want to have a feeling. I want to have some mystical experience and, and let that supplant or replace the hard studies of the content of the Word of God. But the way the Scriptures say life changes is when the mind changes. A big part of our transformation is thinking differently. If I can change the way you think about something, you will change your feelings and your behavior in that area. And let me just say this, as a big part of who I am, you're going to hear more and more about this. I think it was one of the reasons I am here, that Sarah and I are here, is that I believe transformation happens best in the context of a small group. To borrow a phrase from Andy Stanley, circles are better than rows. When I say small group, I refer to a group of 10 to 15 people that gather on a regular basis, preferably weekly, 
They have community. They, they experience transformation, prayer, service with one another, care for one another. Introverts, you need a group. Extroverts, you need a small group. <laughs> Introverts, you think, I just, I don't need people. I've loved COVID. This has been the best two years of my life. <laughs> Extroverts are dying. They're saying, I need all these people. No, introverts, you need a group. Extroverts, you need a small group. Sarah and I have been part of small groups for as long as we can remember. My parents hosted small groups in their house. I look back over the years and I remember the many who have walked alongside of us and we've walked alongside of them and done life together with key moments in our lives. Let me tell you the story of Ed. Ed was a neighbor of Tim. Tim and Thea are here this morning. I don't know if they're, they're picking season tickets back here or not, but they're in the blue chairs with us. Tim and Thea were in our small group, and Ed was Tim's neighbor. And our groups at those points, we just kind of passed around who hosted. We didn't go to the same house all the time. We usually, from week to week, who wants to host next week, and we would move. Tim gave me a call one day in the week, and he said, hey, we need to have group at our house this week. Ed's going to come. And we've been praying for Ed. And Ed would say, he said he would come if, if, he would, if we'd have it at our house. And I said, all right, we made phone calls. Everyone's meeting there. Ed showed up. Now, you've got to understand Ed's background. Ed's background was not favorable to the church. Ed grew up in a Catholic school setting. He had scars on his knuckles to prove it. He was not a compliant child. Yardsticks weren't big enough to make him comply. So he had a view of the church which altered his view of God, but he agreed to come. And Ed came. Ed came for several weeks. He kept coming back. We just kept meeting at Tim and Theus. As long as Ed would come. And lo and behold, one Sunday, Ed showed up at church. And lo and behold, one Sunday, Ed began sharing in small group and, and accepted the Lord in, in, in small group. And I got the privilege of baptizing Ed. And Ed had season tickets, third row, center aisle. Ed's life was transformed, but not just Ed. His wife's life was transformed. His child's life was transformed as they began to become involved in this small group. Ed was being transformed. And Paul says the result of transformation is that we will understand God's will. His good, perfect, and pleasing will. And when we are able to prove God's will, when we are able to discover God's will, we begin to live life on purpose according to that will. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. Actually, let me start in 16. But the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. I find great comfort in that word. Some were doubtful. They had just experienced life with Jesus for three years, give or take. They had watched him perform miracles. They had walked with him. They had been taught with him. They had spent the, the night in the upper room with him with some great deep teaching on what the Holy Spirit was going to do. They watched him crucified. They watched him buried. And now they've watched him re revived, resurrected. And some were still doubtful. Some still weren't sure. There are days I'm doubtful. There are days I'm not so sure. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Lesson number three. Okay? Jesus always has more. More always leads to transformation. And transformation means living on mission. The focus of my life changes when I begin to experience Jesus more. 
as I am seeking more of Jesus and transformation is happening in my life, that my life becomes one that is lived on purpose. It's lived on mission. And while this definitely has a global aspect, and that's a big part of it, and, and, and Lacey and the Dragons, now we did chuckle that that sounded like a band name, Lacey and the Dragons. But to hear their story of how God, how, how God has moved them from blue chairs to around the world, and that your giving helps support them, and we, at the end, we will have the offering or we'll receive the offering and you have the opportunity to put offering in the box in the back or give online. And, and that's not just a thing we do. We do that because, as, as they said, 11% of what you give goes overseas. That's fulfilling of the Great Commission. We give because our life is on purpose. My money now has purpose. More for Jesus. But beyond global, this is a very big local missions verse. Because every believer is given the exact same purpose or mission in life. Your mission is no different than my mission. It's no different than the person sitting on the other side of the room from you. This is the command that Jesus gave. Make disciples. That's your purpose. That's your mission. And while we have the same mission, we are each given a very different context in which to live that out. Jesus says, go. The best translation for that is, as you are going, make disciples. As you are living life, as you are living in the experience of Jesus, as Jesus is giving you more, as your life is being transformed, Make disciples. Do you see the thread that goes all three through three of these? Your neighborhoods are where you make disciples. Your workplace is where you make disciples. Your stores, where you shop. We had a lady in Muncie that she made sure she shopped at the grocery store. She was very intentional. She was on purpose. She shopped the same time every week so she could go through the exact same checkout line and see the exact same lady every week. And she built a relationship and began talking Jesus with her. That changes your attitude in grocery shopping. Jesus has more. When you go to Meyer, when you go to Aldi, wherever it is you shop, Jesus has more in there. You are placed, you are positioned by God strategically into your sphere of influence for his purpose. I'm excited for this next sermon series. The, Eric has been sharing the, the whole God in Mondays. This idea of personal call, that you have a calling on your life, that call is not just for pastors and missionaries. Every one of us, this is our call. Make disciples. I'll tell you the story of Mike, and I'll end with this. Mike was in our small group, different group from Tim and Thea's. Mike was a simple man, but a deep thinker. He tended to overthink. And when he looked at his own life and he thought about his own life, he saw insignificance. Because as Mike said, I'm just a painter. He was a painter for a living. He, he painted houses inside and out. That's what he did. And he considered himself just a painter. He would be hired by insurance companies that when there was a break-in or smoke damage or water damage, he would go in and, and repair it and paint the areas that were affected. Now understand that when Mike went in and a, a window was broken out or, or, and a wall needed painted, Mike didn't paint the whole room. Mike looked at the colors in that room and what was on the wall, and he went out to his truck and he mixed just what he needed to match what was in the wall, taking into effect the years of fading. I don't know how he did it. He had an eye, he knew what mixed, what colors, Mike was not just a painter. And as we began talking about identity and Jesus has more and, and who Jesus is and what he wants to do with our life, Mike came to the understanding that Jesus needs good painters. And his life mattered. 
Your life matters. I want to invite the worship team to come up. And as they are coming and as we play the last song and move into this time of, of offering, I also want to, I want to challenge you to move into this time of prayer. Use the prayer benches that are here. Jesus has more for your life. Are you in need of more this morning? More of what he has? Come, because you're going to find more this morning. There are people that will pray with you. I'll pray with you. My wife will pray with you. Eric, elders, they'll, they'll, they'll prayer team, people will come and pray with you. Or maybe your life needs transformed. You've, you've not received more because you're holding back. There's no room. You, you've not totally surrendered as we sang this morning. I surrender all. This morning you come and you find Jesus and you begin to experience the more of what he has. Father, this morning it is my desire that we experience the unexplainable. Father, the things that only you can do So Lord, speak to each one of us this morning that we might get a clear sense of your moving, of your calling into us, calling us out of a world and into a life that is abundant in Jesus. Father, thank you for the word. Thank you for Jesus, for the assurance, the faith that we have, that we can have in him, for the, for the growing, for the process, for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for friends to come alongside and help us in this journey. Father, do your work. In Jesus' name, amen.